Welcome to Double Line's second annual Roundtable Prime, moderated by Double Line Deputy CEO Jeffrey Sherman. Five thought leaders in today's financial markets will discuss their take on the economy and their outlook for the financial markets. Roundtable Prime was recorded on January 5, 2021, and will be divided into three segments global macro economy, financial markets, and best ideas. Each segment will be released separately once a week for three weeks in January. The roundtable guests, all with decades of experience in the financial markets, are recognized leaders in macroeconomic analysis, market research, and investment management. They bring together a broad array of knowledge across different sectors of the financial markets, including fixed income, credit, equities, real estate, and commodities. All have been sought after for their insights as speakers and as commentators in the financial media. And now, Double Line is pleased to introduce the honored guests of Roundtable Prime, our moderator and our host. Jeffrey Sherman will moderate today's discussions. Mr. Sherman is Deputy Chief Investment Officer of Double Line Capital and a portfolio manager of a number of Double Line's fixed income and derivatives-based strategies. He also hosts the Sherman Show podcast series, which has featured many of today's distinguished guests and was named one of the 10 must-listen podcasts by Business Insider in 2020. Ed Hyman is Chairman of Evercore ISI, where he heads the economic research team. For the past 45 years, Ed has been ranked by Institutional Investor Poll of Investors for Economics and ranked number one for 35 years. Ed Hyman is highly regarded for his origination of econometric modeling and real-time surveys to gain insight into the unfolding business and market cycles. James Bianco is president and macro strategist at Bianco Research, which he established with the aim of originating insights unencumbered by traditional Wall Street research. His commentaries address such diverse subjects as monetary policy, the intersection of markets and politics, the role of government in the economy, fund flows, and positioning in financial markets. Jeffrey Gundlach, host of Roundtable Prime, is founder and CEO of Double Line Capital, an investment manager with investment strategies in fixed income, equities, real estate, and commodities. In 2012, 2015, and 2016, he was named to Bloomberg Magazine's 50 Most Influential. In 2017, he was inducted into the Fiazzi Fixed Income Hall of Fame. Danielle DiMartino Booth. Danielle DiMartino Booth is CEO and Chief Strategist for Quill Intelligence, a research and analytics firm whose commentary appears in the Daily Feather and the Weekly Quill. Prior to Quill, she served throughout the credit crisis as advisor to Richard Fisher, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. She is author of Fed Up, an insider's take on why the Fed is bad for America. David Rosenberg is President and Chief Economist and Strategist of Rosenberg Research & Associates, an economic consulting firm providing analysis and insights to investors. Prior to founding his firm, he was Chief Economist and Strategist at Gluskin Chef & Associates. From 2002 to 2009, he held those positions at Merrill Lynch in New York, where he was consistently ranked in the Institutional Investor All-Star Analyst Rankings. Jeffrey Sherman, Deputy Chief Investment Officer of Double Line, will now open the first of three segments of Roundtable Prime, Global Macro Economy, State of Play and Outlook. Okay, so let me, let me pick up on something that Ed mentioned too about the wealth effect and not just asset prices on the stock market, but also the housing market. And so we, we look back to what the Fed was talking about Prior to the pandemic, they were talking about more equality and sharing across, you know, the, the different income cohorts. But here we talk about wealth effects, and these are for asset owners. Even home prices are people who are owners, not renters. And so um, aren't we creating a more polarized kind of version of society through this creation of wealth effects? And so how, how, is, how are we trying to tackle that going forward? And maybe Danielle or Jim, you guys can talk about that, focusing on the Fed. And should this be part of their mandate? Um, you know, again, they already have two, a dual mandate that's difficult to accomplish. Are we just trying to look to the Fed to answer all of our problems? 
Um, you know, I'll, I'll be quick and then I'll, 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 let, I'll let Jim jump in. Uh, right now, cash out refinancing is running at a hundred billion dollar quarterly run rate. Uh, people who do own assets, and we're talking about half of Americans, um, as opposed to it being so concentrated in the top one to 10% when, you, when you're talking about equity ownership. Uh, so right now the Fed is, 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 trying to, is trying to have policy reach the interest rate sens sensitive sectors, which Powell mentioned in his last press conference. Well, they're doing a heck of a job of that, but we have to bear in mind that the last time they did this, A, it didn't end well, and B, you ended up coming out at the, at the other end with things like private equity investors getting into single family homes. And now you see why this rental eviction moratorium almost needs to be indefinite in length because housing has become so untenably uh, 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 affordable for the average American, for the worker bee, for anybody who has to commute, that there's the, the Fed has backed itself into a corner. And yet the only thing policy continues to do is to widen the inequality gap. So there was a Bloomberg columnist out a few days ago that said that the Fed had done nothing to create the inequality divide. And I got on Twitter and I corrected him and I said, no, the Fed can't do anything to reduce inequality. They can do everything to increase it, but they have no tools in order to reduce it, nor can they, nor can they address climate change, which is a whole nother story. So I'm gonna stop there and let Jim jump in. Yeah, I just uh, on your last part, at least um, they're, they have some kind of um, uh, an impact on the wealth effect where they have none on climate change whatsoever right now. But the bigger problem here is the Fed has defined the economy as asset wealth. You saw that back in March. It, when did the Fed finally start to react and what was the reaction? It was to a falling stock market and it was to aggressively intervening when the stock market was falling. And they pretty much defined the success of their programs as getting asset markets to go back up. And their argument was falling asset prices are going to depress the economy and increase unemployment and rising asset prices are going to undo that. They're going to lower unemployment and they're going to pick up economic activity. Now, I would argue that that has demonstrably not been the case throughout the rest of 2020, but that's the way that the Fed has been operating right now, is that they've got an eye on asset prices and that that is kind of their North Star as to where they're going. Now, I know that they tweaked their mandate and <clears throat> they're going to allow um, you know, inf inflation to run a little bit hot uh, in order to get the unemployment rate down. Yesterday, Ch uh, Charlie Evans of the Chicago Fed said he could see the average inflation on core PCE going to 2.5% without the Fed moving policy. By the way, 2.5% would be a 28-year high in core inflation. It hasn't been above that level since 1993, basically, right now. The problem with all of this is what you saw in the fourth quarter of 2018. Jay Powell comes out on December 19th, 2018 and says, we're gonna reduce the balance sheet by 60 billion a month. It's gonna be an automatic pilot. It's gonna be like watching paint dry. During that press conference, the S&P fell 3% while he was explaining that. And it kept going down and eventually from top to bottom, the correction was 20%. That was December 19th. It's automatic pilot. It's gonna be like watching paint dry. January 4th, after Paul got back from the Turks and Caicos, he goes out on a press conference, uh, or I'm sorry, he gives a speech in Atlanta, the American Economic Association, and he says, we're gonna be patient and flexible. In other words, the Fed spent months and months putting together a policy to reduce the balance sheet. The market had an adverse reaction within two weeks, that policy was in the trash can, and they went with a completely different one. When it comes to inflation, when it comes to the markets, if Charlie Evans says, look, we, we the Fed will tolerate 2.5% on core inflation without raising policy, it's not up to you. It's up to the markets. If we get 2.5% core inflation, 28-year high, and all of a sudden you see the bond market falling and yield spiking, your policy is right in the trash can, and you're going to be forced to raise rates. You go to 2.5%, and the bond market's completely fine with it, then you're completely fine with it too. The markets are going to be running these policies and that's been more and more the case, never more so than the fourth quarter of 2018. 
Yeah. So with that, Jeffrey, thinking about the bond market and you know the reliance on the Fed to provide support, um, whether it's explicit, implicit, breaking charters, all all the multitude of things they did in 2020. Um, is is the Fed really that relevant as you think about the bond market in 2021? I mean, they've laid out the roadmap. They said they're going to keep rates low. That's what all this jawboning, as, as Danielle called it, is to do, is to keep rates low and make the market not have a visceral reaction. How are you thinking about it? What do you think about the Fed relevance as we go into 2021? Well, unfortunately, the Fed is very relevant. They're relevant to the extent that they choose to be. Like uh, Jim Bianco said, they were on a path and then they completely abandon it. And there's all kinds of implicit things that are going on. Uh, when you talk about the bond market, let's talk about the treasury bond market for uh, a subset of the bond market. What you have is negative real yields. And I believe that the Fed wants real yields to be negative. I think the Fed wants inflation to be higher than any interest rate anywhere on the treasury curve. And I think uh, Charlie Evans, the scary thing that he said wasn't so much, we're going to let it run to two and a half percent. He actually used a phrase, we're in it to win it. Now, that suggests that there is a very firm commitment to higher inflation. Not, I, I agree with Rosie that we're not, you know, we, we had years of these policies and we can't get inflation up. But our model at Double Line shows that because of the low level of inflation caused by uh, the economic shutdown and so on, we're going to have about a 2.6 inflation rate, we think, come year over year, come May or June of 2021. And Charlie Evans is saying we're going to let inflation go to 2.5%. She's talking about core, but I'm, I'm talking about headline, but it's, it's probably not that big of a, of a, of a distinction. Um, he, he's saying that because I think they know it's going to happen. In fact, the median forecast of economists is that the inflation rate is going above Two and a half percent at some point during 2021. So when you say is the bond market is, is the Fed irrelevant for the bond market, they're 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 relevant when they decide to peg the yields to do yield curve control, which they've not been shy about it, it, admitting. They've talked about yield curve control. When you look at at demand for Treasury bonds, there isn't any. There isn't any from traditional you know uh, core holders. Foreigners have been selling treasury bonds for, for a while now, and it's been accelerating, right? We have, we have uh, individuals not really buying treasury bonds. We have pension plans where they're almost removing treasury bonds from the efficient frontier analysis, because if you need a 7% actual return, what's a, what's a 90 basis point tenure going to do for you? I mean, even if the yield goes down towards zero, you're going to barely make your actual assumption. You might make it for 18 months, but then you're completely dead. So who's been buying the treasury bonds? The Fed. And so if interest rates do start to go up and uh, the market starts to worry that they, they're not uh, inclined to buy negative real yields, the Fed will have to buy them. And there's a couple other things that are going on that are interesting, and I, and I don't think it's an accident. One of them is that average hourly earnings, which is a very funky number right now because there's been such a big mix shift with the unemployment uh, affecting different strata of, of, of wages differently. <laughs> but right now, average hourly earnings are running year over year higher than the yield on the bond market, on the treasury bond market. So in essence, we're slowly reducing the burden of the debt since we're piling on so much debt, it's helpful if the interest rate on the debt is lower than the inflation rate. Also, mortgage rates right now are lower, the 30-year commitment rate are lower than wage growth, which is another way of handling the debt. So maybe diabolically, they're already toying around with controlling things so that the burden of 330% debt to GDP, when you add up corporate, household, and government, becomes less painful on the compounding curve but that would lead to a, 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 that would require a direct, obvious, in plain sight yield curve control. And the Fed has talked about that. I believe if rates do move higher, uh, and they should, left to their own devices, they sh there should not be a negative yield on the 30 year Treasury bond. If they start to move higher, I think the Fed will act. The, the, the $64,000 question is what, where's their pain threshold? 
um, for wh when they would start to act and intervene. And nobody knows the answer to that because that discussion hasn't happened. But my guess, and this is just intuition, I don't have any you know, hard analysis because I don't think there, you can find any underneath it. My guess is that if the 10-year Treasury pushed up towards 2%, the Fed would start acting. Uh, they want negative. And, and one, one more thing on negative yields, I've been talking about the Treasury market. Amazingly, the corporate bond index yield is now negative two versus inflation. Corporations can borrow in aggregate at negative real yields. So uh, it's, it's a fairly remarkable situation that we have real yields. I mean, mortgage, mortgage rates, if the inflation rate goes to two and a half, the present 30-year commitment rate would be lower than the inflation rate. These are all things you know, that are probably supportive of the economy. But ultimately, uh, we'll go, I will full circle, ultimately, you really do need wage growth. And that, to me, is, is AWOL for the time being, uh, particularly at, at the middle level. I, I've been talking about for months now that the uh, disinflation of wages, of, of earnings, is going to start climbing the economic ladder. Um, at first, it was the baristas that got laid off, and they got their checks so that they you know, wouldn't, wouldn't go homeless. But I think it's, it's going to go up the curve. And um, one, last, one last thing about, about the lockdown. I saw an amazing survey. I saw it yesterday, stale, unfortunately. I wish it was updated. It was taken in July, I believe. But it showed that not, over 90% of people want to work from home at least one day a week. And two thirds of people want to work from home five days a week. Um, now that's stale, that's back in July. But that's, that, that's a really big shock. Uh, we're, we're used to dealing with this, these virtual things, but I, I just think we don't really know the long-term effects of all of these policies and all these virtual things. And I'll just, I'll stop by saying, I agree with Ed. I don't really know, and I worry what the unintended consequences of all these things we're doing are because, and back to Jim, what Jim Bianco said, there are going to be losers in this yeah. game and they haven't, and they haven't been identified or I guess, I guess the gods haven't chosen who the losers are going to be explicitly yet. <laughs> well, don't ask the Fed to play God yeah, at this point. Um, but Ed, he gave you a great segue, Jeffrey did there. Um, but let's talk about uh, one of the factoids I heard was that, you know, COVID wasn't really a game changer. It was an accelerator, right? It accelerated trends that were underway prior to the, the pandemic. Um, how do you think about that when thinking about uh, the overall economy, and the work you guys are doing, and it, whether it's analytical or just counting, as you called it, um, when you think about this acceleration of trends that are underway, and was there really disruption or was it just acceleration? Well, Jeff, I got to go back a little bit, okay? <laughs> There's a lot of water on the bridge. So I'll go back, uh, Rosa, to your points about inflation. The guy's dead on. I mean, maybe we, we get inflation. But uh, I mean, it's been tough. And I think the strongest point, it's not really the strongest point, but a point he raised is on China. Uh, so China growth this year is gonna be 8% and their inflation is essentially zero. They reported this week that uh, the core inflation in Korea is 0.5 year on year. So uh, Rosie, I think you're dead right on inflation, but you, know, you gotta be flexible and if wages start to pick up, then you know we'll change our view. But here's what I want to come to. Uh, in the early 1900s, uh, Alfred Marshall, a famous economist of the time, uh, presented the Marshallian K, which is the inverse of velocity. And so when velocity goes down, uh, the Marshallian K goes up and he claims that asset prices go up. When there's more money than there is economic activity, it shows up in asset prices. And that's, a, that's essentially what's been going on. And so I sort of like velocity going, going down. I will say that uh, from my point of view, uh, the economy since the low point in the spring has come back you know, a lot faster than I ever anticipated. I mean, I can't believe it. You saw the PMI numbers this week. Maybe they're distorted. We do a survey of Christmas tree sales. 
They're up 21% this year. Now, Christmas trees are for higher income people. You, you can't be homeless and have a Christmas tree. But uh, anyway, I think what's, what's going on is, uh, is you know, very inflationary for asset prices. And like you say, at some point we'll get unintended consequences. But Jeff, as, this, as the story goes, uh, we took uh, seven years of technology and crammed it into seven months. And we don't really know what the heck is gonna come out the other end. Uh, this call in itself, the last time we did, did this call, I flew from Punta Cana, where I am now, as you can see with the palm trees, I flew to, L to L L LA. It took me like six weeks. <laughs> And now I just I just get get, get here and uh, having a good time. So it's it's been an amazing transformation, and I don't think any of us. I'm looking at all of us. Every every person on this call has been a road road warrior, and uh, I you know it's 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 done. Uh, so it's it's a real crucible of uh, activity changes. And I can't tell how long people are gonna work from home. Probably a long time. Uh, and I don't know how long people are gonna, you know, not wanna go into the office, you know, where you can, you know, get the culture carriers and talk around the water cooler. But uh, what a period. So I, I think I'm gonna be here you know, at least through March, maybe through the middle of the year. And I've been here, so that'll, that'll be a, a one whole one whole year. Think think of all the all the economic production that went into flying you from there to L.A. and the hotel and the, the oh, right. people that work on the airplane and the caterers and I mean it's it's sort of like all that growth or all all of that economic activity has disappeared, and it's it, it is you know it's it's shifted so remarkably, but to get to Sherman's question, I, I do, I am firmly in the camp that this was not a trend changer, but an accelerator. Um, it's just imagine if this pandemic had shown up eight years ago, uh, what, wow. would business, what would business have done? I don't know. Uh, I mean, it would have just been complete standstill. There's people, and Elon Musk throws up the theory that we all live in a computer simulation and there is no reality, but you got to hand it if that's true to the simulation that they didn't drop this on us eight years ago, because I can't even imagine what would have happened. Yeah, no, it's been, you know, I can speak for everybody. It's been seamless. It's been astonishing. But I also say we're so lucky that we have jobs. The ones you mentioned in the airline related airline, they can't do it virtually. Right, you and I can. And that was what's interesting. I was looking. I was looking at a chart yesterday that showed uh, business uh, shrinkage by industry, and the industry that's had the least business shrinkage of the twenty or so that they had identified. And there's always problems with these surveys because you know, is it there's gray areas on where businesses sit. But the the industry that had the least drop in uh, output was financial services. Well, if I could add one, thing, <laughs> while, while a lot of trends were definitely accelerated and we've seen time compression and we've, we've especially seen that in, in the commercial real estate cycle, I would add that, that as far as trend changing goes, one in 10 um, employees globally pre-pandemic was employed in tourism and hospitality. And so that is going to be a structural change that we will be contending with for a generation now, I think, given how seamless the te technological shift has been for so many of us. I don't think that people fully comprehend or have deeply contemplated what the, uh, I would say 15 year, to pick an arbitrary time frame effect is on mental health and on what is gonna develop from the generation now that is in elementary or junior high school and has had something that resembles a trauma, I believe, occur to them. And I think it's gonna to lead to really significant mental health problems that are, uh, uh, and, and unfortunately, wow. 
that I think is is a trend changer. I mean, uh, but I think isolation and being stuck at home and uh, child abuse and domestic abuse, people aren't talking about these things, but they've exploded, as have violent crimes of all types are exploding. So underneath the surface of, hey, the unemployment rate's down you know, below seven, there's a lot of disturbing trends that are happening. As again, that's, that's, uh, that's Jeffrey. That's that's why the Fed is pushing so hard, and policymakers are pushing so so hard. But uh, I'd say that I, I think that uh, there's a huge amount of pent up demand to travel. Uh, Peggy Noonan has a great uh, opinion piece this weekend. She says, "I have a dream," and it goes on and on about the dream she has to get back to normal. And she says, I can't wait to get on a plane and go to Paris <laughs> just to see if it's still there, that's her, her, her word. But I, I, can, I can see where people, uh, right now I'm in a tourist place. You know, the, the island I am is basically one big tourist destination. And uh, I think in the past couple of weeks it's exploded. It's interesting because I noticed that we follow the TSA traffic uh, statistics to try to see how things are coming back. And it was pretty surprising that the holiday season uh, this year uh, really was up quite a bit relative to the trend <laughs> of prior months, which corroborates, Ed, your idea that there's a lot of pent-up demand. Because here we have, here we have uh, a big spike in COVID cases, and people are supposed to be super careful and yet people are just saying, whatever, I'm, I'm, I'm going to see my family for the holidays. And it's clear in the data that that happened. So it'll be interesting to see if we get yet another spike uh, because of people's pent up yeah. demand being partially, partially uh, you know, spent with their activity here in the holiday season. Jeffrey, we've, we've actually already seen it. If you look at the R not factor, at the kind of the post Thanksgiving peak, there were 25 states that had an R naught factor. So transmittability rates were below one in 25 states. That's the best it had been in a very long time. And as of today, we've taken it back down to just six states with an R naught that is below one. So we are seeing the case counts rise and transmittability rise. And, and that was just Thanksgiving. I'm talking about the, the latter part of the year where this, the, the travel right. clearly went higher. And that, that, that has yet to, had sufficient time to come back and boomerang. So that's still coming. So we need vaccinations. 